introduced, my name is Bob Hopp. I'm an associate professor at, at Rutgers, uh, where I head the Earth System Science and Policy Lab. And I have been working the last several years on climate change from both the science side and the policy side. But I actually got my start um, in this field as an astrobiologist and geobiologist, somebody working on how life and climate evolve on planets of time scales of billions of years. Um, and as, a, as I worked on that, I started focusing on, on some of the dramatic changes in the climate on the Earth and how those have been affected by life. And I got started increasingly looking at the most recent example of that, which is our own time period, where humans are starting to play a role similar to what uh, the first organisms capable of producing oxygen did two and a half billion years ago. So I want to talk to you about the, this problem from this risk perspective that Brian <coughs> so eloquently made the case for. Um, his, the case he's made one, are ones that Michael Bloomberg and Hank Paulson and Tom Steyer, who, who chaired the work Risky Business who funded project, who funded some of our work, have also made. Um, I actually just mentioned that much of what I'm going to talk about is in the book, which is unfortunately uh, due to a, a packaging issue not available for sale tonight, but which you can buy on Amazon. It's pictured there on the left. Uh, and this is work that was funded partly uh, from Rhodium, through Rhodium Group, which is a private sector consultancy that working with the Risky Business Party, partly through the National Science Foundation and partly through New Jersey Secret. So hopefully what I'm going to tell you next is stuff that you all know, but just to get us on the same page. And you see here uh, a reconstruction from, from, instru from instrumental data of temperature over time for the last 130 years. And what we see in this record is that between 1980 and 2015, temp global average temperature, um, in this case we're looking at the first six months of the year so that we can include 2015 as well, rose at an, aver at an average rate of about a quarter of a degree Fahrenheit per decade. That may not sound like much, but it's led to a, a case where this current year is likely to be the hottest year on record. Um, about one and a half degrees Fahrenheit above the 20th century average, about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit above the 19th century average. Um, this was true in January to June. Um, it's almost likely to continue to be true because this is looking, at, looking to be like a strong El Nino year. Um, the last uh, record before the current, before the 21st century, 1998, um, which is sort of one of the top three contenders for the hottest year on record was this very strong El Nino year because El Nino sort of comes on top of this long-term trend driven by, by greenhouse gases, where making you know, the ups and downs. A lot of that is driven by El Nino, and the ups are El Nino. So world global temperature is continuing to rise. Global sea level is also continuing to rise as we pump heat into the oceans and to the ice sheets. Uh, this is work from our own research group. It's a reconstruction of global average sea level uh, since 1880. Um, and what we found is that over the 20th century, uh, global mean sea level rose at a rate of about five and a half, well, rose at about five and a half inches. And going back into the geological record using te uh, various techniques that I could give a completely different talk on, we found that with 95% probability that this is the fastest rate in at least 2,600 years. And it's the fastest rate in 2,600 years, not because sea level was rising faster 2,600 years ago, but simply because the quality of the, the, of the reconstructions degrades as we go further back. Moreover, the rate over the last 20 years, from 1990 to 2010, was about uh, well, 12 inches a century, so twice as fast as a 20th century average. And we have every reason to think that this acceleration that you see is going to continue. Why is this? Well, as we all know, it's linked to greenhouse gases. This plot here is hopefully something you all have seen before, or many of you have. It's a record of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere for the last 800,000 years, a time period in which we have very good records because we can go, into, go to ice cores, extract bubbles of ancient air, and look at what the composition of that air is. From 800,000 years ago, until the first quarter of the 20th century, carbon dioxide <coughs> concentrations in the atmosphere vary between about 107 parts per million and 300 parts per million, with the lowest numbers, 170 parts per million, coming during times when there was a kilometer of ice sitting on top of New York City, the highest parts coming during periods where there wasn't that big ice sheet, like, like current. Since 
19, the, the early 20th century, carbon dioxide concentrations have risen from around 300 parts per million to near 400 parts per million. Uh, during the peak of 2014, um, during the time period when, when leaves were decaying and turning into CO2, um, carbon dioxide concentrations sort of transiently passed 400 parts per million. They spend a lot of this year above 400 parts per million, though with the, with the summer they've just fallen below it again. And next year, there's a good chance that will be a year when, for the first time, CO2 concentrations are above 400 parts per million year-round. The reason behind this is, is very clear. So for the last 200 years, we've been taking carbon dioxide that's been buried in the ground for millions of years and pumping it into the atmosphere. This plot here is showing you the emissions of carbon dioxide from the energy sector. And, well, no, sorry. It's the emissions of carbon dioxide from all sources. Uh, the red curve there is the combination of the energy sector, fossil fuels, with a small contribution from cement. The blue curve air there includes the contribution from changes in land use, so, so deforestation. In 2013, we were putting 40 billion tons into the atmosphere. We put about the same in in 2014, of which about 87% came from fossil fuels, about 8% from deforestation, and the remainder from cement products. So we have every reason to think at the moment that carbon dioxide concentrations haven't yet turned the corner, although 2014, at least temporarily, it appears they may have 2014 emissions by preliminary estimates were, were about the same as 2013. So that's one slightly optimistic sign, uh, but that one that's still preliminary has to be looked at in more detail. But this, the, these changes are posing a growing risk, as Brian was talk about, talking about. And those that the, the clear evidence of the flowing risk led um, the co-chairs of the Risky Business Project, Michael Bloomberg, Hank Paulson, and Tom Steyer, uh, to come to a team. Uh, every, or, uh, Rosemary introduced me and said I was, I, I was the lead author. That's not quite right. The, the person who pulled this together was actually the person who was listed first alphabetically on the book, Trevor Hauser at Rhodium Group. So, so Tom Steyer's people and Michael Bloomberg's people and Hank Paulson's people came to Trevor um, and asked him to do, that they, they do sorts of economic risk assessment, asked them to do economic risk assessment of climate change, and Trevor turned to me, and together we pulled together a team of about 15 researchers who spent a little over a year working to produce the technical analysis that you can read in this book, which also informs this report from the Risky Business Project. And this report went to a committee that was chaired by those three luminaries and also included um, people like Greg Page, the former CEO of Cargill, uh, Donna Shalala, the former um, HHS secretary, um, and uh, Bob Rubin, former Treasury Secretary, George Sultz, former Treasury Secretary, and a number of other people you can see in the picture there. So I want to give you a flavor of some of what we told them. Uh, so when we think about climate change, the first thing is it is a risk issue. We don't know what's going to happen. And there's two major types of risk of uncertainty we need to think about. One is we don't know what's going to happen because we don't know what we're going to do. Right? So we can call that sort of scenario or policy uncertainty. The other that there's uncertainty about how particular emissions, how much warming will go with them. Not, but let's be clear, uncertainty doesn't mean we don't know anything. It means it's a risk. It means it's something we can quantify and we have to figure out how much of that risk we can tolerate. So let's start with a scenario uncertainty. Throughout this presentation, I, I'm going to focus on three different scenarios. We didn't come up with them. They, they, they came out of the climate science community writ large. Um, they underlied uh, the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that came just now. And I'm going to force you to learn a little terminology just because it's going to be more convenient for me. Um, so these three scenarios are called representative concentration pathways, or RC. And they have numbers associated with them that have to do with how strong the climate forcing is. Uh, they're RCP 2.6, RCP 4.5, and RCP 8.5. You can just think of those as low emissions, medium emissions, and high emissions. So RCP 8.5, and I may or may not remember to just say business as usual. I'll probably just say RCP 8.5. So that's a continued, consistent with sort of a continued fossil fuel intensive economic growth. That's that record. RCP 4.5 is sort of a moderate emissions reduction trajectory. RCP 2.6 is a very intense emissions trajectory. So if we continue on that fossil fuel intensive growth path, we see ourselves going more than doubling 
uh, carbon dioxide emissions over the next 35 years. If we get on that middle pass, that would be basically capping emissions at their current level and then bringing them down in the second half of the century. And RCP 2.6 would involve having to reduce carbon dioxide emissions by over half by the middle of the century and bringing them to zero by 2080 and actually developing technologies to pull the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere for the last couple of decades. So this is a range of possible sort of policy futures on the mitigation side or on the, on, on the climate carbon regulation side. Okay. Now each of these different scenarios turns into different concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and different temperatures. Right, it's part that when we emit CO2 into the atmosphere, it goes into the atmosphere, but very quickly, a bunch of it gets pulled out into the land, and a bunch of it gets dissolved in the ocean. So, so there's a, a carbon cycle process that has to be modeled using fairly simple and straightforward models to turn these emissions into carbon dioxide. So that's what these are. And these are numbers you probably are more familiar with than the billions of tons of CO2, because some of these turn into political numbers. So, Business as usual, our CP 8.5 would have carbon dioxide con uh, concentrations around 940 parts per million by the end of the century. That moderate emissions pathway would have carbon dioxide concentrations around 540 parts per million, just a little under twice what they were before the start of the Industrial Revolution. And that blue emissions, or sorry, green emissions pathway, our CP 2.6, uh, would sort of peak carbon dioxide concentrations at around 440 parts per million and then pull them down to 420 parts per million by the end of the century. Each of these different pathways turn into different temperature trajectories, as I said. Uh, and as I said, there's also some uncertainty around what that is. So I'm going to use a term that you're familiar with in a context you're probably not. So I'm going to use the term likely, which we all use all the time. When it's used by the climate science community as this particular meaning uh, that's been imparted to it by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, meaning that there's a two in three chance that this will be the case. It's the, one in six chance it might be higher, one in six chance it might be lower. So the likely temperature increase on that business as usual trajectory relative to pre-industrial, um, and so I think I already said we're about one and a half degrees above pre-industrial now, um, would be about six to 10 degrees Fahrenheit of warming. So there's a 17% chance that it'll be more than 10 degrees Fahrenheit. That moderate emissions trajectory would keep us around three and a half to six degrees Fahrenheit. And that lowest emissions trajectory would have a likely increase of about uh, 2.4 to 4 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you guys are at all following the international climate discourse, you know that there is this nominal international target of 2 degrees Celsius. So this is the one that is most compatible with that nominal international target. So that's the global outcomes. Now, when we think about risk, nobody lives at the global average, and nobody lives at the average year. So we all live in specific places in space in specific days and time. So let's look at the space issue first. Uh, so here's a translation of those numbers into the temperature trajectories for the United States. So down there, you, you can't read that color scale, but you can see at that bottom row, that's the 1981 to 2010 average summer temperatures in the US. So use that to calibrate. As we go up, we're looking at three different time periods. So the next uh, period up, that's 2020 to 2049, so the near 2039, the near term. That middle row is middle of the century, 2040 to 2059. And that top row uh, is the end of the century, so 2080 to 2099. On the left is our median projection. So 50% chance will be more than that, 50% chance it will be less than that. On the right, uh, that's the one in 20 worst case scenario. So we would estimate there's only a 5% chance there's going to be that bad. Uh, but you can see if we look forward, right, we see this increasing march of southerly summer temperatures through the U.S. Uh, and you know, that brings up into the U.S. conditions in the south that nowhere in the country experiences now. So just soak that in. It's going to be a little hard to, to pull details out. So I want to show you a little something a little closer to home and a little simpler to look at. So this is that plot just looking at New Jersey those three time periods. So each of those time periods, we have the three emissions pathways from 8.5, business as usual, on the left, to 2.6, the international target on the right. So average summer temperature in New Jersey in the last 30 years has been around 73 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I'm not sure whether you can see those faint lines, but you can at least see the text. I marked the Virginia, North Carolina, and Florida averages on that plot as well. Um, and so 
we can see, first of all, that none the, the between the, the lags in the climate system and the fact that it just takes time to, to cause economic change, the three different scenarios give you very similar results for the near term. You start to see a little divergence in the middle of the period, and we start to see significant differences among the three pathways later in the century. Uh, I should also tell you what the, what the, how to read this sort of chart. Um, so those bars, uh, the colored areas, that's the likely range. So that's the 67% probability. And then the two whiskers, the top whisker and the bottom whisker, each of those, there's a 95% chance it's below the top whisker and a 95% chance it's above the bottom whisker. So if we turn those into statements, we can say, for instance, that under business as usual, there's about a 60% chance that New Jersey summers will be hotter in the last two decades of the century than they are in Florida today. And if we get on that in RCP 2.6, the international target, there's about an 80% chance that we'll keep summers cooler than they are in North Carolina. So, of course, you know, at least this is, most of this we're looking at conditions, except in RCP 8.5, that are within the range of current US experience, and you can just think about what it is if you're in, in Texas. So, I said that nobody lives at the average year, but you also live day to day, so that means these average summer uh, temperatures, you know, they translate into more extremes. And this will be a theme that I'll bring up again and again, right? Changes in the averages that we see under climate change, even if there's no change in the spread around that average, are going to cause more extremes, sometimes exponentially more extremes. So this is one of those extremes. So this is the, uh, the number of days in a typical summer uh, where the temperature is above 95 degrees. In a typical summer in New Jersey, historically, that's been around four per summer. Um, that dashed line, sorry, I don't have a laser pointer here, but that dashed line that's marked South Carolina, that's around, um, I think, around 12 per summer, so that's where South Carolina is today. Uh, so you see um, 2020 to 2039, that we've gone from around four to around eight or nine in, mo in the median, and, and somewhere in general between the, the his above that historical value and below South Carolina. Um, by the middle of the century, we, the, under the high emission scenario, we, we surpass with a more than 50% probability uh, North Carolina. Um, in particular, there's a 60% chance, I guess we put up there, that the mid-century experience in New Jersey will be more 95 degrees Fahrenheit than you would have it in South Carolina historically. Uh, if we get on that low emission trajectory, there's only a 20% chance that we'll, it will be more than South Carolina. Uh, and in that, uh, that lowest emissions trajectory, that continues to stay uh, true throughout the entire course of the century. Um, on the other hand, if we're in the high emissions trajectory, you know, you're looking at middle road projections around 50 days per summer where, where temperatures exceeding 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Or to, there's a counterpart towards this. I mean, the summers are awful, uh, but it does mean a, a change in the winter as well. Uh, so this is where you're looking at the, the increase in average winter temperatures. Um, and I don't need to walk you through every one of these plots, but just to say, right, if they're, they're, the late century, we've got about a 60% chance that the winters here will be warmer than in North Carolina. So if you're, if you're a gardener, that might be something you care about. Uh, and RCT 2.6, low emissions, you'd probably stay cooler than Virginia. Uh, so that's one type of extreme. Uh, when Rosemary introduced you, she mentioned an article that I had in the, in the Times a few months ago that was talking about slightly different uh, slight sort of extreme, extremes of combined heat and humidity. Um, I'm originally from D.C., so this is something I, I know well. If you spent summers in D.C., you might, you might as well, or if you, even, even, even worse if you've been summers in Louisiana or, or Florida or tech, West Texas, East Texas, I should say. Um, you know, you'll be familiar with this. Um, Right? For the human body, it's a lot more stressful to be under humid heat than it is if you're dry heat. Right? Simply because you can't cool yourself effectively by sweating if the water and the sweat on your skin isn't evaporating. Uh, so here we're looking at the expected number of extremely dangerous hot humid days. And what do I mean by extremely dangerous? So extremely dangerous that these are really rare events. That in the U.S. in the last 30 years only occurred during 1995 during the Midwest heat wave in the worst days of that year. Uh, I'm showing you Illinois, I'll get to New Jersey in a minute. Illinois, for reasons that have to do with the humidity in the area, happens to be the epicenter of these humidity extremes. Um, but so we go, uh, under the lowest emission scenarios, we go from these being about a 1 in 10 year 
event on average to about an annual event. But if we're on that high emissions trajectory, they're not as apt, you don't expect one a year, you expect almost three weeks a year where, where you get these extremely dangerous scenario conditions. And you start to experience something that has never before been experienced in human history, namely days uh, so, so hot that if you go outside and engage in moderate activity for 45 minutes in the shade, uh, you probably will raise your core temperature to heat stroke at levels, which is what we talked about in our, in our uh, time there. Uh, this is looking at the dangerously humid, so not extremely dangerous. These are more things that we're familiar with. So it's sort of the worst day in the typical summer here currently. Uh, and what you see here is that in the, we should expect in the next 20 years to be experiencing more of these sort of hot, humid days than you do in D.C. historically. Uh, you know, by late century, you know, if we stay on that business as usual path, the entire like the entire eastern half of the country from New Jersey south may be experiencing more like, heat humidity extremes of amazing at those today. Uh, these are those ones I was showing you, the, the maps of before, the ones that are like, extraordinarily dangerously hot and humid. And I want you to note on this on this plot that the scale, right, we're going by factors of 10, so we're no longer in that area. Right? We're mid-century, we've, or sorry, in the next 20 years, we've turned those sort of extraordinary, extremely dangerously Midwest heat wave like hot humid days from something that's never been in happened in New Jersey to something that we expect to happen on average once every five years or so. Uh, by late century, if you're on the high emission trajectory, these now become an annual occurrence. So we've talked about temperature, we've talked about humidity. Uh, Brian talked about drought. Drought is actually something that's a lot harder to predict because it's complicated and because precipitation projections depend a lot very we can say if we look at temperature, well, if global average temperature is getting warmer, it's going to get warmer, right? Precipitation, well, if the, the at atmosphere heats up, we're going to get more water vapor in the atmosphere, which will mean we can get more intense precipitation. But at the same time, we also have more evaporation because it's hotter, and we have weather patterns just shifting around. So it, it's a much more detailed process. Um, I don't want to get into this too much just to say the shaded, the areas you can't see in these maps are areas where it's really ambiguous what's going on. So there's pretty good evidence that we will be seeing a springtime precipitation increase here in, in the Northeast and probably a fall and winter increase as well. And then finally, something that I spend a lot of time thinking about, sea level rise. Um, you know, this is, this is something I don't, as I'll get to, is going to be very important for us in New Jersey. Uh, these are our projections. So one thing about sea level rise is the oceans and the ice sheets respond pretty slowly. So we would put sort of 90% probability that under the high emissions trajectory, we would get around two to five feet of global mean sea level rise. And if we bring emissions all the way down to the lowest path, that only buys us about a foot difference. So that may be a important foot, especially if, if your, your house is in that foot. But, but to really see the differences in sea level rise, you, you've got to keep going, right? I mean, because ultimately, yeah. Um, it's what, you know, I mean, we would we would say say for the global mean two to five feet, right? So, but but that's that's but, but that's absolutely right. I, you know, we we designed our projections to be consistent with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, but I, whenever I present these, I also present what we put put as tail risk because I think those tail risks may very well be a slightly higher probability than we say. So, if we, I'm showing you what we would put at the one in two hundred chance numbers up in that box which would give you uh, six feet of sea level rise and, and, and global average under, under business as usual. Now, if we are here in New Jersey, we've got other things going on. Land is sinking because we used to be on the edge of the glacier. Uh, we've got changes in ocean currents. Uh, we happen to be, because of, of the way the Earth's gravitational field responds and the, uh, to melting ice, more exposed than the global average to melting in Antarctica. So we would look uh, and at projection for Atlantic City, we've got roughly an extra foot of sea level rise over the course of the century. So that, that one in 200 worst case is not six feet, it's seven feet. Um, and so this points up one of the thing, themes that, of some of our group's research, right? When you're doing these analysis, it's really important not just to look at the global mean, but to look at, at where you are. And again, same point I made before, the changes in the average translate into changes in history. So Atlanta, I, I've chosen Atlantic City rather than the battery because it's a little more dramatic. Um, so 
we just look at the changes in, in, at the battery, um, which I'm not showing you here, you're looking at, over the course of the century, sort of a 10 to 50-fold increase in the probability of a sandy scale storm surge, assuming there's no changes in the hurricanes themselves, right? If there's changes in the hurricane, that would increase. If we look at Atlantic City here, we're looking at how many historical 1 in 300 year storm surges we expect at Atlantic City. So the sea level rise projected you know, just between you know, 2000 and 20 and 2030 is enough to, turn, to increase that risk threefold. So we turn the 1 in 300 year event into an average 1 in 100 year event. Uh, but because there's really not been any storm surges in Atlantic City uh, Above, above about five feet, as, as these numbers go up, you, you start getting to the point where the nuisance flooding, the, the tidal flooding, exceeds the historical magnitude. So if we look, um, sorry, if you want that to be a laser pointer. Uh, if you look at that, um, like the low emission scenario, like the blue scenario, for the end of the century, right, that middle of the road projection, we've, we've turned, uh, uh, we, we, we've turned this 1 in 300 year event to about a 1 in 3 year event. Under the high projection, uh, the red one, high emissions, you know, we've turned it for, from a 1 in 300 year event to a few times a year event. And if you're at the top end of that projection, right, if we're at that 7 feet, seven feet number, then you've turned it into a 365 day event. So, these are all the physical changes. One of the innovations in our work was to take this and combine it with a lot of work that's been done recently looking at how various things in the economy respond to temperature variations and precipitation variations. Uh, these are some of the impact categories we're looking at. I, I don't want you to stare at these in detail, but just notice the different <coughs> patterns in the maps. Right? So one of the key things to take away from this is that nobody lives at the global average, nobody lives at the national average. Your experience of climate change is gonna be very different in New Jersey than it is in Florida, than it is in Seattle. So, just focusing on that map at the bottom left, that's projected, median projected change in mortality rates at the end of the century under business as usual. Um, and you can see there are some parts of the country that because of the reduction in cold, throughout the entire century see a reduction in number of deaths. So if you're on the mortality side, if you're in Maine, you're doing great. If you're in Florida, you're doing three times worse than the national average. And the national average, in this case, middle of the road, is about as many people as currently die a year in traffic accidents. So let's look at a few of these. Well, let's look at one other point, first of all. Um, again, you're going to keep hearing this theme, the theme I said. So right, regional variability matters, temporal variability matters. So you've got, got these national average numbers, and looking over 20 years, you know, they may not be that large, but year to year, you're talking about a lot more volatility. So here, we're looking at the expected number of what's currently a 1 in 20 year crop loss event under these three different pathways. So 1 in 20 year crop loss event, that would be a national 8% drop in commodity crops, which may not sound like much, but that national 8% is obviously not spread all over the country. That's some region of the country getting hit really hard. Um, and so you can see, sort of by the middle of the century, under all three of those emission pathways, that turns into about a one in five year event, so a fourfold increase in risk. And if you're on that high emissions trajectory, this sort of becomes your sort of annual scale shock. You expect regularly have you know, the sort of temperatures that would currently cause an 8% loss. Now, all of the results I'm showing you are what we get if we face a future climate with our current economy and current land use patterns and current technology decisions, right? So, so this is what we either have to adapt to or avoid for mitigation. So not saying there's going to be these 8% drops, but we've got to be prepared and have the technology to deal with them. Uh, here's the expected number of extremely fatal heat waves nationally. So I mentioned, um, and this is about 25,000 deaths, so one of these 1 in 20 year events. Um, and you can see in that business as usual trajectory, right, these things really take off, becoming sort of a every other year event by the end of the century. Whereas if just moder moderate amount of emissions reductions in the U.S., because we happen to be seated at the point where some parts of the country even benefit under the high-end emissions scenarios, you can really sort of net out the loss. Now, if you're in Florida, you're not going to net out anything. You're going you're gonna to be suffering deaths the whole time. Uh, but the balance is more people will be living in Maine. So, uh, you know, some people suffer, some people, some people thrive. Uh, so, 
this is another look at those uh, the six impacts categories we focus on. So, so I should introduce those because I'm going to make some points, and I want to make the point that we're only there's only six impact categories where we have the resources and the scientific base and economic knowledge base to, to put numbers on. As I'll, as I'll say later, there's a lot that we haven't. Uh, but for each of these impact categories, these are national effects for those three emissions trajectories. Uh, and so we looked at changes in crop yield on the left, changes in, in labor productivity, so, so the number of hours people can work, particularly people working outside, uh, changes in mortality from heat and cold related causes, uh, changes in violent crime, something I didn't know before I started this work, but it turns out people in the criminal justice world know very well is that on hotter days there's more, more violent crime. Uh, energy expenditures uh, as a result of changes in heating and cooling, and coastal damages from storms. Uh, so to summarize each of them, so crop yields is an interesting one because there's a lot of competing effects going on. Um, uh, let, let me finish uh, setting it up. So crop yields, you get um, expanded uncertainty because we've got potential benefits of more carbon in the atmosphere, but also potential the effects of heat waves and droughts. So just reducing emissions there is really buying you a reduction in uncertainty. Uh, labor productivity is one where every little bit of emissions reductions really helps you with the problem. Mortality, as we've already said, is one where a moderate amount of emissions reductions in the U.S., if you're not caring about what goes on in the rest of the world, buys you a great deal, and then you sort of net, don't get that much benefit from the additional emissions reduction. Violent crime is pretty monotone. Uh, energy expenditures, similarly. And then coastal damages, as I've already hinted at when we talked at sea level rise, you get some benefit from emissions reduction, but regardless, there's a lot you've got to prepare for because that system responds slowly to changes. That's simple. It's all at the end of the section. This right. Yes. That's Good. Yeah, yes. 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 I should say. Hey, so this is all 2080 to 2099 under those three emissions. Thank you. So now that I've hit you over the head with the idea that it's different places, let's look at that in detail. Uh, so these are showing you sort of the median projections. So we'll look at the uncertainty later. But for those six impact categories. Uh, and these are all turned into units of gross domestic product. Uh, and so I should explain what that light purple bar is. Uh, when you're turning people's lives into, into units of gross domestic product, uh, there's a number of ways you can do that. Uh, so the cold, cynical way is to just value them at the, at the, the value of their income. So if you're you know, retired, you're, you're, you have no value. Um, the way, fortunately, that's not the way uh, we actually do things analyses usually. So if you're looking at regulatory policy, what, what happens is that regardless of how old the people are dying on, um, the US government uses what's called a value of a statistical life. So that's about $8 million a person. And so the dark purple is just valuing people's lives at their lost income. The light purple, which you probably can barely see, it is using this $8 million figure. So the first thing you can see, so that top bar, that's a national average. And, um, if we look at the national average, the dominant two things are mortality, people's deaths, if you're using this value of statistical life, and lost labor productivity, um, with secondary contributions from all of these things. New Jersey is slightly different. So New Jersey, we don't have a large mortality effect. We have a, a smallish uh, labor productivity effect, but where we really are exposed is on the coast. Um, and you can just see, if you go, the rest are ordered from north to south, so you can see how Florida compares Right, twelve percent of the median projection compared to that national average of a couple of percent. So let's look again at New Jersey, making that same point in a little more detail. And here you can see the uncertainty around these things. Right. So um, just to, to help you read this, so the mortality we've got twice uh, mortality if you just value people their income, and then mortality uh, on the right if you're valuing them at the value of statistical lives. And those little blue lines show you where the scale changes. Uh, so, if you're using a value of statistical life, um, you know, we, could, we, may be either, we may be either an increase or a decrease at the end of the century under business as usual in mortality in New Jersey. Probably more likely than not, it would be an increase in mortality, and therefore that could be the dominant contributor by these calculations. But it's, you know, it's a lot of uncertainty when, when we're at our latitude here. Uh, but those coastal impacts, you know, you're looking at about eight tenths of a percent um, of GDP per year in New Jersey from damages and coastal storms. Um, and then we can see we've got a significant labor and energy contribution that are small. So let's look at that over time. So two types of, of losses associated with sea level rise. So first of all, 
There's the things that are lost permanently because they fall you know, below the tide line. Um, so this is the amount of state property that falls below the tide line. Um, bar and whiskers we read as we've been reading. Uh, for the coastal stuff, I, you know, I, I mentioned we emphasize the tail risk because I think we're the, the sort of the consensus numbers are probably a little low. So that diamond is a 99th percentile projection. Um, and so you see we're talking about sort of 20 billion dollars uh, worth of property in New Jersey that fall below the high tide line between 2000 and 2030. You know, going up to around 40 billion dollars by 2050, and then depending on you know, where we are in those uncertain sea level rise projections, anywhere between 60 and 150 billion dollars at the end of the century in property. Now, the first property in New Jersey is worth quite a bit, so just keep that keep that in mind. Uh, the other cost is a cost of, of these extreme events, the cost of the storms, which aren't going to be the same every year. But you know, if you look at what the average of those are, uh, so right now the average storm damage in New Jersey. I should add that, that these storm analysis we did in partnership with Risk Management Solutions, which is a company that works with insurance agencies to help them assess stormers. So these are number, that historical number is exactly what they would tell an insurance agency. That's about $800 million a year average losses in New Jersey from coastal storms. Taking into account only the cost of, of sea level rise, so not including potential intent increases in the number of intense hurricanes, which could double these numbers by mid-century and triple them by the end of the century. Um, you know, you're looking at around $2 billion, so more than a doubling of that number by the middle of the century, and around $3 billion or more, uh, possibly as much as $6 billion by the end of the century. And again, you know, in the coastal area, thing, and this is something we really need to think about in terms of how we're going to adapt to, because you can see, even the, you know, even though in many, many risks, reducing emissions makes a big difference in this century, sea level rise isn't, isn't one of them. Uh, here's one where, where we do see a bigger emission. So I mentioned that labor productivity. So this is the labor productivity and the people who are either working outside or in manufacturing. And we don't have that much manufacturing in New Jersey, so that's most of the people working outside. Um, and so you can see, so the, the effect becomes most significant under business as usual, uh, sort of late in the century, where you're talking about a sort of order of 1% to 2% reduction in labor productivity. That may not sound like very much, but you're talking about something on the order of 12,000 to 25,000 full-time employees. So, you know, not, not huge, certainly it's larger in other parts of the country, but nothing to lie about. Um, and then this is energy expenditures. Um, just like with mortality, this is one where we sort of, sort of sit at a cusp between heating and cooling. Um, so you, know, you start to see the largest numbers towards the end of the century here, and you're talking order of a few percent, 10, up to 10 percent increase in energy expenditures. Um, and finally, this is just making the point I made about mortality. Mortality, it's really a problem of uncertainty in New Jersey because we've got, we've got this balance between old death. So, these all are reasonable numbers. We're talking about a few percent of GDP. And I want to get back to the point I mentioned before. They're not actually, you know, these are all real risks. These are things that uh, businesses should be adapting to. If you're, if you're putting out a 30-year a bond on an investment and you're not thinking about these risks, you're probably being delinquent. And it's certainly delinquent that the rating agencies aren't making. But there's a lot of other risks out there that are harder to quantify and that are really key when we think about this problem in a societal scale. So what, what do I really work on? Um, so, as I mentioned, I, I started working on this on, on timescales of billions of years. Uh, and when we look at the geological record, we see that, you know, first of all, there's not many examples of increases in carbon dioxide and temperature as rapid as the one we're causing. If we go back 55 bil uh, million years, we may find one that's of comparable timescale. This is something called the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. That put a huge amount of stress on ecosystems. For 30,000 years after this happened, mammals all experienced dwarfism. They all became small so they could get, get, they could get rid of the heat faster. Right? So I don't know what that looks like when we're talking about civilization and people, uh, but putting that in that context, right, that, that's according to massive scale. Effect. More generally, we depend as a civilization on a lot of services provided by the ecosystems, and we don't really understand how all those ecosystem services work what benefits it provides us. So if they collapse and we're not prepared, that, that's a pretty significant question. Um, I've mentioned already, you know, I think there's a good chance that the sea level rise numbers may be a little higher than we're projected. Um, that's sort of included in our analysis, but it's still something to be concerned about. And then I think what 
are really um, some things we're trying to go after now as we take this research forward, which means uh, both expanding the sort of impacts we're looking at and looking outside U.S. borders. Uh, so one is disruption of critical weather systems. I and mean, we can see you know, in, in California at a, at a relatively mild scale by global, by global standards what the effects of a, of a disruption of a weather system is. Um, and we can see in Europe what the effect of the refugee crisis is, right? So, and if we start seeing these two things together in countries that don't have the governance and infrastructure and capacity to deal with it, you may be seeing a lot of those, those climate refugee problems um, associated with disruption of critical weather systems and more generally just with changes in history. So that's something we actually want to look at. There's, there's a growing body of literature on the relationship between migration and um, and climate. And then there's what former Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld would call the unknown unknowns. Right? We're pushing at the system. I've already put it in the geological context of, of how we're doing that. As we keep pushing on the system, it's probably going to exhibit un, you know, un, unexpected behaviors uh, which constitute another sort of risk. So let me come to what we do about this. And we've, got, we've got two different sides of the problem, right? So if we go back, right, we've got the, that's a bad one to look at, right, we've got the, the mitigation question, right, so, so do we go on that business as usual pathway or do we bring carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions down so that we're at a level consistent with the international target? And then two, uh, it, has we, how, what, how do we deal with the risks that we've already sort of baked into the system? So here's sort of the, the good news and the bad news. Right? The good news is that if you look uh, you go to the International Energy Agency, which is probably the best source on this, this stuff, and you look at their projections of emissions going forward based on what countries have committed to do under the United Nations Framework Convention. Um, we, if countries abide by those pledges, we're not on that RCP 8.5. We're also not on RCP 4.5. We're somewhere in between. That blue curve is the global carbon budget we have, the amount of carbon dioxide we can, we can, we can emit if we want to have a 50% chance of keeping warming below 2 degrees C. And you can see under current pledges that's used up in around 2040. So the good news is it's less soon than it would be if we didn't have those pledges. The, the, the bad news is that it's not enough to, to meet the target the countries have said they want to. Yeah? That wasn't in China, right? China has committed, and I think they committed before IEA did their analysis. So that they committed to peaking in, um, in 20, uh, 2025, I believe. Maybe 2030. Um, there's plenty of countries that haven't committed, but that's not really the right, the right question. The question is, have, have, has the US, China, and the European Union, and India put some pledges in? And the, the answer is yes. And India is really not, you know, India is really more of a growth problem than a current problem. I, I, I think one of the slides I, I took out uh, was the slide that actually showed you where emissions are coming from. But right now, we got about 25% of global emissions from China, about 15% uh, from the US, and about 10% from Europe. So, that, so those three countries, those three groupings constitute more than half of global emissions. And, and so that's why it was a big deal when President Xi and President Obama sort of made an announcement last, uh, last year, or earlier this year, of their commitment, joint commitment to reduce emissions. Uh, so, different sort of dollar figures than what we've been talking about. This is the International Energy Agency's estimates of the amount of energy infrastructure investment needed either A, on the left, under countries pledged uh, uh, pledges, and on the right, under a trajectory that's consistent with keeping the warming below 2 degrees C. Um, they didn't actually have in this figure the numbers of what they expected if countries don't follow their pledges, their report. Um, probably come from, comes from being an international agency, sort of assumes countries are gonna do what they say they're gonna do. Um, but I think it's going to, I think these numbers are gonna be in the ballpark, even if you went on the fossil fuel transmission directory. So under current pledges, we're talking about a $36 trillion investment in global energy infrastructure over the next 15 years. What they found is that if it's only a 6% more, you could get on a trajectory uh, that, that's consistent with keeping emissions uh, you know, keep, keeping that opportunity to see. Now that involves a significant shift of those resources from fossil fuels to uh, various sorts of clean and renewable energy. Uh, but it's, you know, the, the thing about the energy infrastructure system that's hard to get your hand around is that's a huge amount of capital. Um, there's going to be a huge amount of capital in that system 
regardless of climate policy. So a lot of it is about direction. Yes, it is. Still with a 50% chance, though, right? Still with a 50% chance. Uh, yes. 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 No, that's a bad. I mean, I don't. It asks clarification questions, but but say philosophical questions for later. But but you can I, all the questions have been clarification. Uh, the other thing is, that, as I've said, we, we have to adapt to the changes already made in the pipeline. And this is something that I think a lot of this group is supposed to be particularly involved in because you know, mitigation is fundamentally a global problem and it, you know, what we can put pressure on global leaders to mitigate uh, through various channels like what Brian was talking about, uh, but adaptation is not a, is a local problem. It's especially a local problem here in New Jersey where I think we have something like 500 <coughs> municipalities and all of them have say over land use. Um, and so, you know, we have to think, given these numbers, you know, what is the right response to do after Sandy or after the next disaster, which you know, probably won't be as large as Sandy, but, but maybe. Um, you know, is there an approach that, that, you know, we need to be stronger than the storm, we have to get back and rebuild things as they are as quickly as possible? And you know, implicitly assume that the next time this happens, the rest of the country will again bail us out. Um, do we, as we rebuild, take, you know, break, take into account that there is this sea level rise building in the, the pipeline, um, raise things, harden them as possible, or and do we, or do we accept that in some areas, right, even if you raise things, you're still going to have this exposure, and the best approach may be to raise them with a Z and, and retreat from the shore. I don't think there's a single right answer to these questions, um, but this is a, a dialogue that we should be having, and we probably shouldn't be waiting until after the next time the storm comes so that we're doing it in a crisis situation. So, uh, just the takeaways. So by the middle of the century, uh, we expect that under business as usual, summers in New Jersey will likely be hotter than in Virginia. Uh, and the number of historically expected number of dangerously humid days will be higher than it necessary. By the end of the century, looking at the tail risk, there's a 5% chance that, that summers in New Jersey could be more than eight, 7 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than in Florida today. Right? That would be placing us well outside of U.S. experience, with a month per year on average as hot and humid as the worst of the 1995. So that's, that's the tail risk, right? That's, that's a, the risk that's accumulating if you, if you don't get off that mitigation path. Uh, off that no mitigation path, um, and you know small risk five percent, uh, but you have to, you have to ask the question how much risk do do you tolerate? Uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions drives down those tail risks. Uh, with that severe emissions reduction trajectory, the RCP two point six one, uh, that's about ninety five percent chance that we can keep New Jersey cooler than South Carolina today. So still you know not going to completely eliminate the tail risk. You do eliminate that seven degrees warmer than Florida risk. Uh, but there's still a tail risk. And as I had gone in, again, again, economic impacts are unevenly distributed. Here in New Jersey, you know, we've got some of these heat impacts, but the main thing we have to focus on is coastal effects. And we're doing a lot of work at Rutgers, myself and many other people, focusing on, on sea level change and coastal effects. Um, so of the impacts we examined, you know, coastal, what was a big deal? Um, if we look at sort of middle of the century, um, we're likely seeing a, uh, somewhere between around a 40 to 170 percent increase in average annual co uh, coastal storm damages, and these are risks that we need to be planning for. But meanwhile, we also need to be thinking about a lot of the stuff we haven't quantified in the study, which I think is, you know, here we're talking about numbers on a couple percent of GDP. Those happen to be numbers that are comparable to what people are talking about expending to get on on the on that 450 net. Um, but you know, the, the, those numbers are made more compelling when you start thinking about what's not included in that sort of analysis. So migration and conflict being one that I think we have the path to try to get some numbers on, um, but also ecological catastrophe and also other risks we haven't thought of yet. So sorry we don't have this book on, on, on sale tonight, um, but I, well, you can get it on Amazon, and if I encountered you again, I would be happy to sign it. Um, so thank you. And I think we're gonna